Yo, what's up YouTube family? It's your boy Kuzi back at you with another hot TikTok reaction video. Y'all don't forget to like, subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this. Let's get it, baby. The Louisiana Purchase, one of the most significant land acquisitions in American history, took place in 1803. It involved the United States buying approximately 828,000 square miles of territory from France for $15 million. This vast area stretched from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and doubled the size of the young nation. The purchase was prompted by several factors, including the desire for expanded trade opportunities and control of the vital Mississippi River, as well as the fear of potential European colonization in the region. President Thomas Jefferson, despite his strict interpretation of the Constitution, saw the opportunity and negotiated the deal with French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte's envoy. The Louisiana Purchase had profound effects on the United States. It facilitated westward expansion, opening up new lands for settlement and exploration. It also led to conflicts with Native American tribes who inhabited the newly acquired territory and raised questions about the expansion of slavery into these regions. Overall, the Louisiana Purchase reshaped the geopolitical landscape of North America and set the stage for the United States to become a continental power. The Louisiana Purchase, one of the most famous events in the United States of America. Man, if you didn't know about it, today you will find out. Louisiana Purchase Exposition, also called the St. Louis World's Fair, was held in the city of St. Louis, United States, from the 30th of April to the 1st of December 1904. So these remnant buildings that seem to be left from Great Tartaria and then used at the St. Louis World's Fair were then detonated and demolished. Was this a ritual to symbolize the destruction of Great Tartaria? We must remember that alongside this, the overall purpose of the Industrial Revolution from the 28th of April 1762 to around the 15th of October 1843 was to entirely replace the scientific achievements and the communities from Great Tartaria. Even the 47-story Tower of Jewels, which had been constructed by Tartarians whilst the civilization of Great Tartaria flourished, was included at the World's Fair called the Panama Pacific International Exposition. That was held in San Francisco, Northern California from the 20th of February to the 4th of December 1915. Who knew that the Louisiana Purchase had something to do with Tartaria in the great Louisiana or St. Louis Exposition that they would say, or the, or the St. Louis World, World Fair, to be correct? Right, more American history that I had no idea about. Someone said, you should look up the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase... I thought to myself, maybe not in an American accent, so I looked it up, didn't I? What a complete and utter clusterfuck! Louisiana didn't just used to be the state that it is down the bottom. Louisiana was actually a whole middle section of the United States, a whole middle section. And it was called the Louisiana Territory. It was owned by France. France were owners of the whole of Louisiana. Now, Louisiana as a territory was super important because the Mississippi River ran all the way through it. So to the west of Mississippi, this land was very sought after. Everyone's like, I want, to, I want a piece of Louisiana. And the Spanish were like, oh, we want the piece of the Louisiana. And the Americans were like, hey, we should take Louisiana. And the English were like, by God, we want Louisiana. So France owned Louisiana, this large chunk of land between 1682 and 1762. Then Spain came along and they said, actually, we want it, we want it, we want it, we're gonna take it from you, France. And they did a deal. And France said, okay, you can have Louisiana. And the Spanish said, oh, thank you very much. And in 1762, the Spain secretly acquired Louisiana from the French. Until, until in 1800, 
Napoleon came to power in France and he said, we must get Louisiana back. And so he came on over and he said, yo, he said, yo, Spanish, we're taking it back. All right. And the Spanish said, what are you talking about? We're not giving you back Louisiana. It's fucking brilliant. We fucking love it. And, uh, and Napoleon said, what about if I give you Tuscany instead? We'll do a swap. And for some reason, the Spanish thought, well, that's bloody marvellous. That's quite close to where we have all of our land already. We'll take it. We'll take it. We'll do the deal. And so in exchange for Tuscany, the French reacquired the whole of Louisiana, this giant state. Now, in 1776, the Revolutionary War had happened and the United States was formed. And the United States at the beginning was just 13 states along the East Coast. I don't fucking know that. No one told me that. But it was just 13 states along the East Coast. So Thomas Jefferson came in and he was like, if we get Louisiana, that's like a whole big chunk of the land and we can expand the United States of America. What did he do? He said, yo, yo, Frenchies, Frenchies, give us the land. Napoleon was like, fuck that shit, bro. I'm not giving you Louisiana until the British started threatening to go to war with France back in Europe. And poor old Napoleon was like, I can't fund the fucking war. I can't fund it. We don't have any money. So we can't fight the British. I knew we were coming to this somehow because we're a bunch of fucking warmongers and colonizationers, aren't we? For fuck's sake. Anyway, Napoleon needed the money. So what did he do? He said to Thomas Jefferson, all right, pal, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sell you Louisiana. I'll sell you Louisiana for $15 million. $15 million for the whole of the middle of America. For the whole of the middle Freezing of North dollars. America. Thomas Jefferson was like, boom, you got a deal, buddy because Napoleon needed money to fight a war with England. Now this is where it gets even more fucking hilarious. Thomas Jefferson bought the land. The USA didn't have enough money to buy Louisiana. So guess what they did? They went to the banks and they borrowed money to purchase Louisiana from the French so the French could fight a war against England. But guess who they borrowed money from? They borrowed money from the English. They borrowed money from the English banks to pay Napoleon for Louisiana for which Napoleon used the English money to prepare for an attack from the English. Well, England essentially paid the enemy <laughs> so, they, so they were better prepared to go to war with them. So just in case you thought politics is stupid now, don't worry about it because it was even more fucking stupid back then. And what became of Louisiana? Well, that entire territory is now 15 entire states. It covers 15 present day states. Isn't that amazing? There was 13 at the beginning, expanded out, and when they purchased Louisiana, it became 15 states that we know today. And so the expansion of the United States of America continued. You are welcome. Man, who knew that they sold a whole center from up Louisiana on, Louisiana on up for $15 million. Man, that is crazy. That is crazy cheap for um, the middle of a country. I guess, you know, that wasn't theirs. That is wild, man. But like I say, you learn some new every day. When people look at this, they think about the Louisiana Purchase, but it's much deeper. Let's talk about the Kingdom of Louisiana. The Kingdom of Louisiana, AKA the Bourbon Dynasty. The Bourbon Dynasty governed France from 1589 to 1793 and from 1814 to 1830. This is the flag of the King of Louisiana. If you could see the Florida leaf, we still have it on our flag today. If you could pay attention, then I'll show it to you right now. They used the birds to disguise the figure. I want to take you to France right quick to the city called Orleans. And this is the flag of Orleans, the Kingdom of Louisiana. The capital and largest city was New Orleans. So the next time you go to Louisiana or down to New Orleans, just know that when you're in the French quarters on Bourbon Street, you're taking the time back into history of the Bourbon Dynasty. Mm. The United States purchased the Louisiana Territory, which encompassed approximately 828,000 square miles, 2.14 million square kilometers of land. The main figures involved in the purchase were Thomas Jefferson, the President of the United States at the time, and Napoleon Bonaparte, who was the leader of France. The purchase was made for a total of $15 million, 
which Napoleon needed to help fund the Napoleonic Wars. This acquisition greatly expanded the territory of the United States and played a significant role in its westward expansion. Thanks. What if I told you that a revolution led by enslaved people changed the course of history forever? The Haitian Revolution, spanning from 1791 to 1804, was a monumental event that not only led to the first successful slave rebellion, but also the establishment of Haiti as the first black republic in the world. This uprising was ignited in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, where brutal conditions and relentless exploitation pushed enslaved Africans to rise against their oppressors. Under the leadership of figures like Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines, they achieved the unimaginable. They defeated the powerful French forces. The impact of the Haitian Revolution rippled far beyond its borders. It struck fear into the hearts of slaveholders across the Americas and inspired countless enslaved individuals to dream of freedom. Moreover, it forced European powers to reconsider their practices and policies regarding slavery. The revolution's success proved that enslaved people could not only fight for their freedom, but also govern themselves with resilience and dignity. If you found this story of courage and triumph as inspiring as we do, like, share, and subscribe for more incredible tales from history. Man, I wish I wish they would teach this part of the Louisiana Purchase in a in the United States schools, man. But it kind of make you wonder why they don't teach this part of the Louisiana Purchase in American or the United States schools. But I'm pretty sure we already know why, right? Yeah, come on, man. It's it's crazy, man. But that is like a very intricate part of the Louisiana Purchase, and you know what I'm saying. It's it's very important, in my humble opinion. Well, let me know what you think down below. Did you know that that was part of the Louisiana Purchase, and that that was a very intricate part of it, or not? Did you know America wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for Haiti? Leading up to the Haitian Revolution, America already had hundreds of thousands of Native Americans here, but the Europeans were claiming their states in different parts of the country, and the French had the Louisiana Territory. Even though they had all this land, New Orleans was really the only thing that was developed, and it was used as a port to bring in things from their base in Haiti. And Haiti was the richest colony in all of the Americas. They was producing over 50% of the world's coffee and sugar. But once they lost that, he pretty much just gave up on the whole project, and America was already scared for the French to come invade them, so they approached French to buy New Orleans. But the French had pretty much gave up on the whole America experiment and they decided to sell the whole Louisiana territory over 530 million acres for only about $828 million in today's money. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States and most of this land was given away to white people and kept away from African Americans. Message. 1803, representatives of the United States traveled to France to negotiate for the city of New Orleans, which was then held by the French. Instead, they gained the entire Louisiana Territory, a total of 828,000 square miles. This vast acquisition of land cost the United States approximately $15 million, or only about three cents an acre. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States, extending its western border to the Rocky Mountains and its northern border to Canada. The purchase also gave the United States control of both banks of the Mississippi River, as well as the port city of New Orleans, which connected the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Thirteen states, either in whole or in part, were eventually carved out of this new territory. But doubling the country's size with the sudden stroke of a pen naturally brought consequences, and the Louisiana Purchase set into motion events that would help shape U.S. history for the rest of the 19th century. For one, the new territory was not empty. Across its vast expanses lived 50,000 to 100,000 people, including white settlers, most of whom spoke French, enslaved and free black people, and Native Americans. Questions were raised as to whether the settlers would be considered American citizens. To deal with the native populations, the United States developed a policy of forcible removal from their lands. By the 1840s, the U.S. Army and the various native tribes in the plains were in a continual state of war. 
Slavery was another key issue for the Louisiana Purchase Territory. Would the practice be allowed to continue there under U.S. authority? States were divided bitterly over the issue, with the North against the extension of slavery and the South in favor of it. Both sides worried that new states formed from the territory would shift political power to their opposition. Debates over this issue fueled tensions that would lead to the American Civil War. What if I told you this is what St. Louis looked like in 1904? Would you believe me? Probably not, because this is what St. Louis looks like today. This was the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, or the Louisiana Purchase Expo. The mainstream narrative claims it was a combination of trade show, civic showpiece, and a monument to culture, along with more than a teeing of American pride. But some things just don't add up about the narrative. For example, it took three years to build 150 buildings like this. That would be almost 42 buildings a month, and keep in mind, the buildings were of this stature. They also say these buildings were temporary, just like the Chicago World's Fair. But come on, just look at this. Why so much intricate detail for a building that's temporary? And the reason for destroying these buildings were the same as the Chicago World's Fair. And it was because they were built on a lease for a year. Come on. I don't know about you, but this does not look like something you would keep up just for a year. There are many theories that say these buildings came from a one-world civilization, and that the writers of our history don't want us to know about them. That theory would explain why there are so many Greek Roman style buildings all around the world. But that's just a theory. Like, follow, and leave a comment about what you guys think about this. And always remember to do your own research. St. Louis or St. Louis World Fair. Who knew about that, man? Who knew that that was part of the Louisiana Purchase? Before this video, of course. Let me know down below. Had it not been for the Haitian Revolution, America would be 50% of its current size, if not more. The Louisiana Purchase doubled America's size, and it would have never been a Louisiana Purchase if there had never been a... Oh, Umar. Dr. Umar. Here's a black history and capitalism fact I bet you didn't know. Did you know that the Louisiana Purchase only happened to stop a slave rebellion? The Louisiana slave market was the largest and most profitable slave market pre-Civil War in North America. Louisiana was one of France's wealthiest territories. Although profitable, it did not hold a candle to the sugarcane trade in St. Dominique, now known as modern day Haiti. In 1791 on the island of Haiti, thousands of freed Africans as well as enslaved Africans revolted. This put in jeopardy France's sugarcane market in Haiti. Napoleon was not gonna allow the colony to be taken over by formerly enslaved Africans. That's why America was able to purchase Louisiana from France at a steal, able to double the size of the country. France used the money from the purchase to try and quell the slave rebellion in Haiti, but it didn't work. After the purchase, slavery ended up expanding into Louisiana territory, specifically Missouri, where 100,000 slaves were there within the next 20 years. I'd also like to note that after this purchase, millions of indigenous Americans were forced onto reservations, forever displaced because France, well, they had to make a buck. Fall in like for more. Man, shout out to my Haitians. Shout out to the Haitians and shout out to the Dominican brothers and sisters out there. Holy shit, Black Caribbean and Haitian TikTok. I just realized something. The Haitian Revolution was the reason for the Louisiana Purchase. Oh my God. It was sitting right there, duh. Occam's razor, the French were going broke and they needed money. How could I not see that? Uh. No wonder they sold the Louisiana Purchase at such a ridiculous price. What? Four cents an acre? Well, that's crazy numbers. Four cents an acre? Man, that's crazy. They almost gave it up for nothing. Did you know Haiti made the Louisiana Purchase possible? 1803, France is fighting against its richest colony, Saint-Domingue, Haiti. Now, this is a really, really big deal. Haiti is making France rich. I mean, Haiti is producing 60% of the world's coffee, 50% of the world's sugar. Haiti is known as the Pearl of the Antilles because they're producing so much wealth for France. 
Now, of course, France is desperate to make sure that they keep Haiti as its colony. And so, naturally, they're trying to find more money to fund this war. So France did the unthinkable. They sold the Louisiana territory for pennies per acre. For only $15 million, the United States doubled its territory. Once again, four cents an acre is literally dirt cheap. The Haitian Revolution transformed the United States. Overnight, the U.S. doubled its land size when it acquired the Louisiana Purchase from France. And France only sold this huge piece of land because they were losing the Haitian Revolution. France was so desperate, they sold over 800,000 square miles of land from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains for only $15 million. That's pennies per acre in today's currency. To be more specific, four cents per acre. This is known as the greatest real estate deal in US history, and it's all because of the Haitian Revolution. Before the Haitian Revolution, France attempted to build a French empire in the Western Hemisphere, and they were well on their way because they possessed the richest colony in the entire world, Saint-Domingue, which would soon become Haiti. Remember, at the eve of the revolution, Saint-Domingue was producing 60% of the world's coffee and 50% of the world's sugar. Saint-Domingue was making France rich. And so when the Haitian Revolution broke out, France poured an unprecedented amount of resources into fighting the Haitian army. They even sent the largest military expedition to Haiti, sending their top veteran fighters in order to stop the war. But they were unsuccessful. During the last year of the 13-year war, France saw that they needed money and their dream of world domination was impossible, being that they were losing control of their base of power in the Caribbean, Saint-Domingue. Also, France was fighting against Britain, and they saw Britain as a real threat. They believed Britain could just come and take the Louisiana Purchase by force. So Napoleon cut his losses, and he did the unthinkable. He sold the Louisiana Purchase for dirt cheap. Although the Louisiana Purchase is a symbol of how successful and powerful the Haitian people were with the Haitian Revolution, there were some tragic unintended consequences. After the revolution, Haitians abolished slavery forever in Haiti. But due to the Louisiana Purchase, Americans were able to expand slavery into this vast territory. Also, the land didn't belong to France in the first place. It belonged to the Native Americans, so this wasn't the deal of the century, this was the steal of the century. Man, message, man, she right on point with that one. Ding, 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 she hit the nail on the head with that one, man. With the, that was, that's crazy, man. It was literally the steal of, man, of American history. Man, that is crazy work. Big facts. You're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? Glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? You're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the northern hemisphere, and the bottom is given to the southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how? Where else could you put the northern hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. Ain't that so? Now, what I'm showing you right now, what you're looking at right now, is a map, the original map, where it shows pretty much states, land masses, pretty much names of stories or lands. You know what I'm saying? So, so first thing I want to point out, look at the compass. See something a little odd? They got south where north is north where south is east where west is and west where east is so basically they basically flipped our sense of direction 
you gotta remember, we weren't slaves. We were prisoners of war. And whoever wins the war writes the story. That's very, very blatant. Who knew that? Everything that we built together. And we built over because they know they could not tell this lie if they don't destroy the evidence. How are you gonna tell a lie with everything around you we build it and when you go inside of them, all you see is us. Oh shit, the lie could not stay. <laughs> they have to destroy it. So they just throw a little bone at you, said, well, it was just Chicago, it was the founder, it was Haitian, there was no such thing as Haitian, it was the empire. The entire America was running by us, including some region in Canada. When you heard Canada speaking French, who do you think the French people was? They was not whitey people. These were the, what you call the Huguenots or the Arcadians. That was us running the whole place. <laughs> Listen, man, people have no idea. Now, once you hear French, you assume this is just a, a whitey person. No, it's not. It was never them. They learned the language. But that was all us. People that look like us, but me personally, my identity. Hmm, interesting. Now the French colonists were mostly men, and the thought of sending a proper white woman to the colonies was almost unheard of. They tried sending women before, but they were prostitutes, and you can't marry a prostitute. And a proper white woman wasn't going to live on the colonies. They had to be protected from the savage nature of the enslaved. So the French created a system called placage, or a legal entanglement if you will, which allowed white men to legally shack up with women who were free, indigenous, or enslaved. And it got its start right there in the colony of Saint-Domingue. While in other colonies like Canada and Louisiana, they relocated young orphan women known as the King's Daughters. It wasn't just the orphans. France also recruited willing women from the farms and the cities they were known as casket girls because they brought all of their belongings in trunks or caskets. Now the casket girls ended up in Louisiana and were considered white French Creoles. AKA vampires. If you don't know, nay, if you didn't know, nay you know. And if you don't know, go do your research. Marie Therese Metoyer and her children had amassed nearly 12,000 acres of plantation land along with at least 99 slaves. Marie was 25 in 1767 when she caught the eye of a Claude Thomas Pierre Metoyer. She was two years older and had already had four children, but Metoyer was so taken with her beauty that he arranged with her owner to live with her for 19 years in defiance of church and political censure. He fathered 10 children by her and ultimately set her free with 68 acres of land. Now free, she went to work in the fields at 44, trapping bears, growing indigo, and tobacco. Colonial records detail the bateau cargo of 300 bearskins and two barrels of bear grease she shipped to New Orleans in 1792, along with 9,900 rolls of tobacco. Gradually, she managed to buy all of her children out of slavery, two daughters and two sons, born before she met Metoyer. She acquired more land and 16 slaves of her own, beside whom she labored in the fields. Her descendants would become the wealthiest family of free Negroes in the United States, the embodiment of the French-speaking gens libres de couleur, or free people of color, whose Creole culture distinguishes Louisiana to this day. They would leave as a monument to their industry the lushly beautiful Melrose Plantation in the Cane River region. Interesting facts. Who's ever heard about her? Let me know down below in the comment section because I never heard about her until this video. We won the fucking war. We used all voodoo. All magic. The Spanish was pulling up on, on Haiti, pulling up on the island. And before they can get off the island, off the boat, motherfuckers' teeth was falling out their mouth. Some of them started melting. Some of them hair started falling out. Some of them got so sick that they was literally throwing up their intestines. They didn't even have the strength to pick up their guns. Then it got so bad that they couldn't even come onto the island. Boats was exploding. They was 
falling into the water, getting attacked by sharks, all type of shit was going on. They was turning them on themselves. We had we had our people over there tapped in. They putting spells on them from afar to the point where motherfucking they on the ship killing each other. You better know the power we come from, man. We ain't got to touch you. Do you know you have no clue what you are, man? Well, they don't want you to know that, but everybody knows that the Haitians practice that hoodoo. You know, that's what most of them are about, man. Like, it's nice. It's not a secret. And uh, Africans, too. Like, you know, and they're not the only ones, but we know that this is a fact in, in the culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on now. Why would they try to hide it up? It's that power. interview with you and y'all was talking about you know um voodoo yes right and how you know we utilized the swamps because we were masters of it mm -hmm. right and we knew that they weren't masters of it and we can beat them in that particular terrain mm -hmm. but specifically when it comes to voodoo voodoo is seen as you know um as what's the word i'm looking for you know uh, a bad thing essentially right, right? right. and of course you know the dark arts and everything to black and dark is considered to be bad right and then of course white magic is considered to be good mm -hmm. but the reality of it is is we've been masters of the elements right and the, um, the spirit our entire existence mm -hmm. so you 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 don't get the Haitians winning you don't get Nanny and the Maroons winning without them being able to utilize right the elements that's all it is yes Voodoo and all that it's you connecting with nature and the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. That's all, because it's all the same. Right. But us understanding that in a real way, not white Jesus. <laughs> right. You, you dig? Yeah. Understanding that we are the essence, we are all of this stuff. We as melanated people are, we are nature. We are the spirit realm. All of it is connected and we can get our strength from that. And that's what they did in, in Haiti. And that scared the hell out of white people and it scares them now. That's why they made voodoo something negative. Yeah. Because what we started doing, we started getting in those swamps with those alligators where white people couldn't go into. Even here in, in the Americas, we would live around those wild animals because we were on the same page with them. We weren't afraid of them. Mm. We had a spiritual connection with them. Even in Africa today, you don't see a lot of African people getting attacked by the animals because they have a relationship right. spiritually with the animals. Yeah. Um, when we and our brothers and sisters were fighting these white supremacists using their voodoo system, that scared the white supremacists so much, they started making movies in the 1930s about zombies and yeah. black Haitians. Yeah. The early voodoo movies had Haitians in them, mm. them portraying Haitians. The word zombie, which the zombie genre is real big today, that comes from a, a Haitian man named Jean Zombie, mm. who was killing white people yeah. in um, Haiti during the revolution. Mm. After the revolution was over, they were getting the French out. It was this light-skinned slave, former slave named Jean Zombie, who was slaughtering the French. So his name became synonymous with terror. Mm. That's where the word zombie comes from. So they've always been afraid of that. They taught us to be afraid of, yeah. of voodoo too. They taught us that it's witchcraft and right. it's evil. And then we start listening to the white supremacists and start forgetting our history and our essence because yeah. They've scared us out of it because it, it disconnects us. Right. If you want to, if you want to spiritually and psychologically control people, and they have this connection to the element that empowers them, mm -hmm. you have to break that connection yes, first indeed. because that's going to give them confidence, mm -hmm. right? Now they're in harmony with mentalism, right? Mm -hmm. Now they know how to use the power of the mind. They know how to use everything around them that becomes a solution for whatever problem that they have. Mm -hmm. And then we go into alchemy. I ain't gonna lie, that scene was powerful with the little boy riding on the back of that old alligator. It's something else, eh? I know it, I know it, I know it. But that's the power of, uh, you know, that they, that they, that they embrace and that they have over there. You could just say that it's evil and this and that hoodoo, voodoo, but uh, I believe it's something more. It's uh something to do with the ancestors ancestors and the spirit the spirituality of you know embracing their uh misfortunes and 
the uh, the things that they've been through and, and their ancestors, man. Uh, I, I don't know. I may be wrong, but uh, I know it's something powerful because ain't nobody over here riding on the back of no alligators, especially not no little kids or crocodiles, whichever one you want to call them. San Domingue, 1802. Napoleon had anticipated victory in a matter of months. He was wrong. The war in Haiti is the first example of guerrilla warfare in the history of modern warfare. For Haitians, it was the Armageddon. They had nothing to lose by going all out. Losing the war was losing their liberty, and they put their liberty above everything else. And the French at that time had never experienced anything quite like that. It was enormously bloody. The Haitian Revolution was, until that time, the most bloody war there was. The rebels of Saint-Domingue dragged the war on. Two months into the campaign, as the rains set in, they stall the French, for the guerrillas have a secret weapon in this war. Napoleon's troops are vulnerable to yellow fever, unlike most locals who have developed immunity to the disease. The treatments available are few, elixirs of wine and bark, or bleeding the patient. The soldiers just died like flies. In September of 1802, General Leclerc reports to Napoleon that of almost 30,000 men, only 4,000 are still able to fight. Two months later, Leclerc dies as well. Meanwhile, Napoleon has rallied 20,000 fresh troops to invade New Orleans. Instead, he has to send most of them to Saint-Domingue as reinforcements. 3,000 remain at a port in Holland, still braced to take Louisiana. But a last fluke event seals the mission's fate. Ice storms, and the ships were literally trapped in the harbor by ice. It would have been interesting to, to think of what might have happened had the ships been able to embark, um, had they actually gone to Louisiana. Napoleon is barred from invading Louisiana, not by American will or diplomatic finesse, but by ice, the mosquito, and an island rebellion that defied prediction. Napoleon had the option of accepting Toussaint Louverture as his governor general, and he could have supported Toussaint in this, the restoration of the French Empire in the Americas. But the Haitian Revolution demonstrates the arrogance of power. It shows that one should not underestimate people of whom we know very little. Haiti was the second independent state in the Western Hemisphere. Haiti was a watershed for Napoleon. It was the beginning of the end because these were the best trained and the most skillful of French troops, the flower of the French military, and they did not come home upright. The world is closing in on Jefferson as well. His detractors are demanding that American forces capture New Orleans before French troops get there. Across the Western territories, frontiersmen muster with drills to ready for the seemingly inevitable assault. One wrote this letter to the Kentucky Gazette. 700,000 persons will not wait for Mr. Jefferson. They are almost in a state of revolt. 3,000 Kentucky militia could put the U.S. in possession of the fairest country in the universe. Good God, can all Western America be dead to their true interests? February 1803, Congress passes a resolution directing the president to raise a militia of 80,000 men to invade New Orleans and seize it from the Spanish. Jefferson instead digs in and holds out for his last chance at diplomacy. 
Francis Hot 09. Most of these were French speaking peoples. A lot of them were free people of color. And uh, of course, the nearest French speaking city of note was New Orleans. So a number of refugees flocked to the city, more than doubling the size in a short time. The influence of the Saint Domingue refugees has had a profound influence on the development of what we identify as Louisiana culture. Many of these were very skilled artisans, many of them classically educated. They brought a lot of culture and traditions to Louisiana and New Orleans. They really established much of the cultural advancement of the city. They were amongst the first to establish newspapers in this area to establish education. The Saint-Domingue refugees, blacks, whites, free and slave, brought with them the French language and French traditions of Saint-Domingue and brought that into New Orleans, a city that was already beginning to more Americanize after the Louisiana Purchase, which suddenly refrancified rather quickly. It's amazing in that this period you have so many diverse groups, you have a burgeoning commerce, you have a burgeoning population. As a great port city, you are getting people from all over the Maritime. Visitors remarked that you could hear the languages of all nations of the world. The accommodation to new residents of all types was fueling this physical growth of the city as former plantation lands began to be subdivided into city squares and building lots. You have the creation of Fallbergs beyond what had been the old city limits, the Vieux Carré, which pretty much stopped at Canal Street on the upriver side and Esplanade Avenue on the Down River side. Immediately from the time that Claiborne and Wilkinson come in to receive the territory, it's a period of great turmoil. Claiborne's project was, okay, how do we get this established society to be integrated into the United States? There is some sense on the part of Americans that Louisiana needs some time to become more American, to be less European, to be more orderly, to grasp the legal system of the United States, which of course they don't really do because they keep the code law in lieu of going to English common law, which is what the rest of the United States operates under. The native Creole population, which once of course ran the city in every way, economically, politically, culturally, sees these incoming groups with increasing levels of threat. America is in this situation where they have for all intents and purposes colonized an area. You have structures of government already in place. You have cultural differences and racial differences. There was certainly tension between the original population. Man, old oh, Haiti. Even though that war was so important, they still didn't get the proper respect that they deserve around the world from the other countries, especially in the United States. Because today, in this day's time, they are still getting great and pillaged for all their resources, like the oil, the diamonds. Come on, man, it's the gold. There's pr plenty resources over there. It's like another, it's like a smaller Africa in a way, resource-wise. Why they should? Not, there's no way they should be as poor as they are economy-wise right now. They should be one of the richest. Thriving, more, most thriving economies in the world, man, because of their resources, just like Africa. Once again, they are, man, they have been gravely, gravely graped and pillaged, man, and still are today. Like, it's crazy. But, uh, y'all, I hope y'all liked the video, enjoyed the video. This is the end of the video. It's your boy Koozie, I'm out. I'll holla at y'all next video. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Hit that notification bell on your way out, especially if you like the content. Have a good day.